So really quickly, this was the same video that was on my channel like three or four weeks ago. I got an email this morning saying there was copyright infringement. I think I had a Drake and Quavo song in the credits or something like that. YouTube just completely took the the uh, video down. I don't know why. Usually they tell you and then you know you just don't get revenue from it. But they took it down completely, so I'm re-uploading it without the song in the credits, and that's why this is the same video again. So it's not anything new if you've already seen it. What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. It's your boy Nick here. Big dogs got to eat fantasy football. My last video I put up was. My top three breakout candidates, I'm just going to go position by position and name my top three sleepers. Not guys being slept on, but dudes, as always, being undervalued, being picked really late that you can get at a good value. And today we're going to do the first episode of this. We're going to go quarterbacks, and then we'll hit the other skill positions later in the week or later in the month, whenever it might be. If you've been playing fantasy football these last couple years, I'm sure you've adopted the late round quarterback strategy. If you're not first, you're last. If you're not getting one of the top guys, A-Rod, Tom Brady, or something like that, wait till way late in the draft because... The difference between like quarterback six and quarterback 16 is probably very minimal on a points per game basis. So there's no reason to reach up for, you know, QB seven or eight like that when the next guy is two rounds later, going to give you the same amount of fantasy points. So without further ado, these are my top three guys that I love going later in the draft that you can get in rounds 10 or later. Numero uno, a guy I loved last year, a guy I'm going to love again this year. I just talked about him in my recent Redskins Outlook video. That's Kirk. Someone commented on one of my videos back in the day and said, I was talking about how I picked up Ham from the supermarkets, my favorite cold cut, and then someone said Ham is the Kirk Cousins of quarterbacks. I don't even know what that means, to be honest with you, but if you're saying it in the way that I would say it, I love Ham. I love Kirk Cousins. Let's go. So Kirk Cousins, the Redskins quarterback, they don't have the contract situated yet. Well, they do. He's franchised, but they're looking for a long-term deal. It doesn't matter. He's going to be their quarterback in 2017. Right now, he's getting picked as quarterback 11, 101st overall off the board. So if you're in a 10-team league, that's in the 11th round. Now, Kirk Cousins finished as QB5 last year in fantasy. He had the third most passing yards in the league, 4,917, 25 passing touchdowns. He added four scores with his legs. Just a really good all-around year. Now, there's tons of room for improvement in my eyes. That 25 passing touchdowns leaves a lot of growth. Any any other quarterback, there were four other quarterbacks that had over 4,350 passing yards. Four other quarterbacks. The lowest passing touchdown total besides Kirk was 33. That's eight more touchdowns than Kirk had. So when you think about it that way, Kirk was actually the anomaly there, and there should be room to grow. He should be scoring more touchdowns. So we look at, you know, why didn't he score more touchdowns? And that was simply because they were terrible in the red zone. They were awful inside the 10 yard line. There were 34 quarterbacks last year that had at least seven attempts inside the opponent's 10 yard line. 34 of them. Kirk Cousins had the lowest completion percentage of all 34 quarterbacks inside the 10 yard line. It was like 30, I think it was 31.8% was his completion percentage inside the 10. He had 38 attempts there, only scored eight touchdowns on those attempts. So you're like, oh, maybe he was just really bad. Maybe he's just an inaccurate quarterback, but that's not the case because he was actually the sixth most accurate quarterback in the NFL last year. 72.5 completion percentage per aimed throw. That's per pro football focus. So he was actually the sixth most accurate quarterback, even with all those inaccurate throws near the end zone. For me, that says that he didn't have the weapons there. There was no one to throw to. And when you look back at it, it's the truth, right? His top wideouts were Deshaun Jackson, Pierre Garçon, Jameson Crowder. Those are not goal line, end zone, red zone targets. Sean Jackson's good for deep balls. You do not throw the ball to him inside the 10. Pierre Garçon's more of a slot guy, middle possession receiver. He's got a little bit of size, but you're not throwing him fades. And then you got Jameson Crowder, obviously, small, small dude, not a guy that's finding the end zone. Of course, you have Jordan Reed there, who was banged up, missed four games. He only played in 12 games, and he was either a decoy or banged up for the majority of those 12 games. So you're taking out a lot of weapons, basically all the red zone weapons that that the Redskins have. They didn't have a run game, so they were very one-dimensional down there, and that definitely hurt Kirk. Now, when you look at what they did this offseason, right, they brought in Terrell Pryor, six foot four, six foot five. They have their first round rookie from last year, Josh Doxson, six foot two, coming back. Uh, they signed Brian Quick, Quick via free agency. I'm not sold on Quick, I don't care about Quick, but Terrell Pryor, Josh Doxson, both super, super, super duper good athletes. Their skill set is perfect near the end zone. They're both really tall, really big catch radius, really good leaping ability. Go get the ball, throw them fades. That was something Kirk did not have in his game last season, and that's something that they're going to be able to improve upon in the red zone this season. They're going to have Jordan Reed back healthy, hopefully, so that, that wide receiver core quickly 
flipped around. You know, Djax is obviously out of Washington, as is Pierre Garçon. So these are the top guys they have, and clearly, you know, they're red zone friendly. Now, I'm not expecting Jordan Reed to play the full 16 games. It's not what he does. Uh, but just having him going into the season healthy, as long as the reports are there, it's saying he's healthy, you got to count that into Kirk Cousins' value. And I actually went back, and I'm going to post the split right here. I looked at games that Kirk Cousins and Jordan Reed has played together versus games they haven't played together since Kirk took over as the quarterback in Washington. In split is games that they've played together. Almost all the numbers increase, especially that passing touchdown total. It's more than 0.6 passing touchdowns per game more. Almost 40 passing yards a game more when Jordan Reed is in the lineup. And that includes two of the games last year where Jordan Reed was basically a decoy. So as long as Jordan Reed's in the lineup, Kirk Cousins is a much more effective quarterback. And I guess you have to assume going into the season that he will be healthy, as long as no injuries occur throughout the preseason. You look at the team overall, they are a top 12 scoring team last year. They scored about 25 points a game, threw the ball, the seven most pass attempts in the NFL with 607. Assume that that uh, passing volume is going to stay there. With, they still have all the weapons there. Their run game is not dominant by any means, so I wouldn't um, I wouldn't imagine a major drop-off in any category there. So I think the real knock on him last year was just that his touchdown total wasn't there, and that was because how poor they played in the red zone, and now that they have these weapons, it's going to be a big a big boost up for Kirk. So that's my, that's my boy this year. I got another boy this year, a Colin Tygod, the god, out of Buffalo. Another guy that was on a lot of my late round quarterback lists last year ended up there again this year. Currently going as QB 17, 124th overall. Basically playing on a one year deal. They just like don't believe in the guy. I'd be pissed if I was Ty Guy right now, I'll tell you that. No damn respect. So what I see going into 2017, Nothing has changed in that offense that says Tyrod won't play up to what he's done in 2016 and 2015. And you're saying, oh, he wasn't really that good in those seasons, so why, like, so what are you bringing that up for? Well, he was. On a points per game basis, fantasy-wise, he was quarterback nine both years. So 2015, 2016, he was, he was a top 10 fantasy quarterback on points per game basis. So that's a legit statistic. So he's a, he's a quarterback one. The way I see it, his ceiling isn't much higher than like that QB9, but his floor is not much lower than that either. When you're looking at his efficiency as a fantasy quarterback, he was third in the NFL in 2015, fantasy points per dropback. It was like 0.58, whatever the numbers are, but points per dropback, he was he was third among quarterbacks in 2015. He was sixth in, uh, among quarterbacks in 2016. So the consistency is there as long as he's playing, which, you know, he's missed like three games over the last two years, which is obviously a concern for any running quarterback, but the efficiency and the fantasy points are there. And, and the concerns are obviously the volume there, right? So they were like the second heaviest run team in the entire NFL last year, only behind Dallas. But the way I see it, what he loses in passing volume, he he more than makes up for it with his ground game, right? Over the last two seasons, he's averaged 40 rushing yards a game, every game. So that's a, that's, that's a floor that he provides to fantasy quarterbacks that almost no other quarterback in the NFL does provide for fantasy owners. But the best part about that like rushing aspect and the best part about his rushing game is how consistent it's been. You look at the statistics over the last two years. In 2015, he had, let me read it off to you, 568 rushing yards, four touchdowns on 104 attempts. 2016, he had 580 rushing yards, six touchdowns on 95 attempts. So within 12 rushing yards, within two touchdowns, within 10 attempts. So you have to think that that stays steady. Like he's not one of those guys like Cam who goes off for 800 yards, 14 touchdowns. Next year drops to 300 yards, five touchdowns. You know, Tyrod Taylor shows you what he's going to do on the ground. And that's what he's done the last two years. What I like even more is the Bills have a new offensive coordinator, Rick Dennison. He's a guy who's with the Broncos, uh, Kyle Shanahan. He's his experience is in the West Coast offense. He's constantly having the, the quarterback on the move, constantly bootlegging out. And he said that in this new offense, they're going to feature Tyrod Taylor's movement and his ability to run. So I'm not going to go crazy and say like, you know, the ceiling is through the roof now with Tyrod. But if anything, that boosts his value a little bit from a run standpoint. It can't hurt him. Another move that happened this offseason that's definitely going to help Tyrod is Mike Gillisley moving over to New England. He was a big piece of that goal line work that they had in Buffalo last year, that successful rushing attack. Gillisley had six rushing touchdowns inside the five-yard line last year. Now, where are those carries going to go? Yeah, they might go to LaShawn, but LaShawn McCoy had a bunch of carries inside the five, too. I don't think they all go that way. I don't think they all go to Jonathan Williams as an unproven back. You got to think at least a few of those play go to Tyrod. So maybe it's a bootleg out and he has more passing touchdowns. Maybe they let him, maybe they let Booby spin. Maybe they let Ty God run the ball a little bit, right? So if anything, it stays the same. If not, it's a it's an upside for Tyrod. He'll have more plays inside the five yard line where they can utilize that bootleg, that West Coast offense, that movement that he has, that ability. So I see that as as another ceiling for him. You look at the stats last year and you look at how much they used Tyrod in inside the ten yard line last year as a passer, right? He ranked twenty sixth in pass attempts last year inside the ten. He had just twenty six attempts. And he ranked twenty six, so do the math. 
and they're a top 10 scoring team in the NFL. For me, that says that he's being underutilized there, or he has a much higher ceiling. If they're going to be scoring so much, he should be passing it more there, or there's the opportunity at least that is there for him. So if they decide to switch things up a little bit this year, let them run more, let them pass more in there, you know, the opportunity is there because they do score a lot. And I know what everyone's thinking, obviously Tyrod's success as a passer lives and dies by Sammy Watkins' health. I took a look at the splits, Sammy Watkins, Tyrod Taylor. Since Tyrod took over as the Bills quarterback in 2015, here's what they look like. In split is games that they both played together. Out of split is games that Sammy Watkins wasn't there. You know, it's not like a, it's not a crazy difference. Nothing jaw dropping. But you can see that Tyrod's passing touchdowns number, passing touchdown number, increases pretty heavily. It's it, it's a small number, but it's it's 63% increase from 0.9 to 1.47, and it's 25 passing yards more per game when Watkins is in the Bills lineup. It looks like he's going to be fully healthy for the start of 2017. They're going to baby him through training camp, baby him through OTAs or whatever he's doing this off season. So it's going to be a lot of like guessing and a lot of that. But as long as you know they progress him well. He should be in the lineup, and he should be a player for them. Obviously, it's you know it's anyone's guess if he stays healthy, but you have to assume that he's going to be healthy entering the year. So those numbers take a big increase if that happens. Also, we don't at this time at the time I'm filming this, we don't know where Jeremy Macklin's going to end up. It could be Baltimore, it could be Buffalo. If it ends up in Buffalo, I like Tyrod even more now because Macklin's a, a good wide receiver. He's been really solid the last couple. I mean, he had a bad year last year, but um, him as a as a number two in Buffalo is huge for Tyrod. Because even if Watkins goes out, then he has a legitimate number one. Because Macklin's proved he can be a number one in Philly's offense, KC's offense. If anything, it's an upgrade to what they have. And they drafted Zay Jones, who is a good playmaker and will be a great piece to that offense. All in all, I'd say Tyrod's proven he's a top 10 quarterback consistently, fantasy-wise. He'll have Sammy Watkins back this year. He might have Jeremy Macklin. He has Zay Jones working for him. He has a new OC who wants to run the ball. There's no downside here, in my opinion. That brings us to number three. Mr. Firecrotch, Andy Dalton, out in Cincy. Getting picked, quarterback 19, 128th overall. Admittedly, he's my least favorite on this list, but his price goes accordingly because he's the least expensive to draft. It's quarterback 19. What's his deal, right? He's been in the league since 2011. He's hard to predict on a year-to-year -year basis because it seems like every year one or two of his top weapons get injured, right? And he's never had a consistent core of weapons or receivers or his tight ends that stay healthy. So he has these years where he goes off when they are healthy and then years where he struggles a lot when they're not healthy, right? I.e. last year, A.J. Green, Gio, Tyler Eifert, none of them played more than 10 games. And most of those games were not together at the same time. But when he's had the weapons to work with, Dalton's always been a super undervalued quarterback in, in terms of fantasy, at least. Put this up a little bit. So what have the Bengals been doing to kind of counteract that? You know, add some depth. They took John Ross this year with the number nine overall pick. He's wide receiver out of Washington. He is technically the fastest man in the NFL. Ran a 4-2-2 combine 40, which is the fastest recorded time ever. But John Ross isn't just a blazer. He's not. He's a good wide receiver, good playmaker, really good agility, really good with the ball in his hands. He's, he's a guy that Dalton's going to be able to utilize a lot. This is the second year in a row they've used an early pick on a playmaker like a wideout. Last year they took Tyler Boyd, round two. Uh, so now they're setting up a nice little core around Dalton to work with. They got A.J. Green, obviously, as the one. Um, John Ross, Tyler Boyd, Eifert. Joe Mixon they took in the second round this year. Mixon's going to be the feature back there eventually. It might not be at the beginning of the season. It might not be until halfway through the season, but he is that guy for them. There's no doubt in my mind. Gio's coming back from an ACL injury. The way I look at it is Mixon and Gio as pass catching backs are basically redundant. Their talent, their skill set there is redundant, which is actually a good thing for Dalton because I look back at Dalton's career and, and how well, how successful he's been when he's had a receiving back in the backfield, you know, versus when he doesn't. So, I mean, you could really only measure that off of Geo, but the reason I say that their talent is redundant because now he's going to have one regardless because if one of them goes down, he'll have someone who has the talent to pick that up. And uh, I'll put these splits here. Boom. So these are in split versus out of split. In split is the games that Geo's played with Andy Dalton. Out of split is obviously the ones he hasn't. And when you're looking at it, you're seeing a huge increase in basically every passing statistic there. And the biggest one being one that matters to us, almost four fantasy points more per game when Geo's in the lineup. So when he has a pass catching back like that, he is much better in a fantasy perspective of things. And that way, even if Geo, you know, he can't recover from his ACL, he should be back. Uh, but if he can't, Joe Mixon is still going to give that ceiling to Dalton regardless. So that's, so that's really big, Joe Mixon, not only as a runner, not just to this offense as a whole, but to Dalton. Uh, what I also looked at was the splits of Dalton playing with Eifert and without Eifert. And I'll put them here. Again, you could see that on a per game basis, 
almost four fantasy points more with Eifert. Uh, 50% increase in passing touchdowns per game when Eifert's in the lineup. Just a big increase there. So when he's got his, his ca uh, pass catching running back, when he's got Tyler Eifert in the lineup, when he has guys like A.J. Green and John Ross on the outside, he's going to have a lot, a lot, a lot to work with. Now that being said, Eifert is recovering from his back injury. So he has surgery this offseason. Who knows if he's going to be playing again early in the early in the season. And to be honest with you, I think he might take a little longer to recover and he might not even be full health until a week, two weeks, three weeks into the season. But we're really early in the off season still, so there's gonna be a ton of reports coming out on that. That being said, if all these guys are full health, if all these guys are ready to roll in Cincy when week one rolls around, Dalton, man, he's gonna be extremely undervalued at QB19. Just remember, a few years back, he was a top five fantasy quarterback when he had all his weapons around him. They got too many weapons, too much mix of talent, too much mix of speed, versatility, height, all that kind of shit for him not to be able to produce. And if he doesn't, then that's on me, that's on him. The one thing I will say though, the Cincinnati offensive line is not gonna be that good. They lost Adam Whitworth, their stud tackle, and now they're gonna have some issues on that line. So that's definitely gonna hurt Dalton's value a little bit, but these added pieces such as John Ross, such as Joe Mixon, these are good players for dump offs. So John Ross is a guy you could set up outside screens for, Joe Mixon's obviously a guy that can catch these short dump offs out of the backfield. So, you know, as much as the pressure might hurt Dalton a little bit, like he has the weapons to counteract that. So I, I expect the the yards and, and the production to stay intact as long as these weapons can stay healthy. I was going to wrap the video up. My top three quarterback sleepers next episode will probably be running backs. I got to figure out what I want to do because I did, I've done a few sleeper videos already and I've hit a lot of running backs. So you can check those out. I'll link, I'll put them in the description below. As always, go follow me on Twitter. Go subscribe to the channel. If you're new to the channel, you enjoyed, give it that thumbs up. Do whatever you gotta do. And we'll be back next episode with whatever that may be. Adios.